Hello there, I'm Chris Heilman and today I want to show you how to create clickable cards in HTML, CSS and a tiny bit of JavaScript. Now this is a very common design pattern these days that you see in almost every page. You have these fully clickable cards that actually have things inside them that should also be clickable. And that makes no sense. In HTML a link should actually point to one resource and not have another link inside it. This is invalid HTML and it makes no sense in terms of semantics as well. So people want to have these cards that you can click anywhere on and you go to where the link points to. And at the same time, people also want to have links inside that go somewhere else, in this case to the doc browser that I wrote the other day. Now, how do we do this? There's very complex JavaScript solutions, but what we do here is some plain HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Let's get started with the HTML. Now, if we go to the unstyled version of this one, it still makes sense, it's still understandable. Now the HTML is a list and that makes sense because the dogs and the wombats are both things that are actually part of a semantically logical group. Screen readers would also, when you use a list, tell, that it, tell you that it's a list with five items, items one of two, item two of two and so on and so forth when you navigate it. So this is something you don't need to tell the end user of a screen reader for example because by using the right HTML you get that functionality for free. We also use headings in there, which is good for SEO and is also good for screen readers. And then we have a paragraph and a link. It's pretty plain HTML, but it's not doing what we want it to do right now because you can't click anywhere in here to go to that link. You have to click on the link as it was meant to do. So how do we turn that into a card without going into, down a rabbit hole of JavaScript and all kinds of frameworks? We turn this into a clickable card by using CSS generated content on the link itself. This is a not hard to do thing, but it's something you might not have done before. So let's talk about it quickly. In the CSS that you see right now here, we just put some margin padding on the, uh, on the, link, uh, on the list itself. And the list items become, uh, also get some margin and padding in the background and a position of relative. And this is important because this means that if we position anything else inside that list item right now, it's relative to the list item rather than relative to the viewport. So if you want to contain some position element in another element, position the outside element in any way that it actually other than static to make sure that it stays within that element. We then style the link, give it a color and give it a set index of one. That puts it above everything else in that list item. So it now actually is covering already the paragraph and the heading, but it doesn't have any dimensions. So of course it basically wouldn't cover them. It just is a brief block. So it just has this little thing on the bottom here but here it's not there yet. But we can use CSS to generate content in on the fly. So in this case, we just say after that element, after that link element, we position this new element absolutely and give it a top left, right and bottom of zero. That means it's actually covering the whole LI. We don't give it any text because we don't want to display any text. Now, if you look at that in elements and you actually inspect the page, you see that, yeah, that it's generated here after and it's covering the whole LI. You can test this by putting a background color in there. Like for example, a peach puff, which is always a great color. And that actually now covers the whole uh, LI item. If the LI itself had not been positioned relative, it would cover the whole screen. And that's something that we won't, don't want to have. We want to keep it inside the LI. So we needed to position the LI itself relative. Let's get rid of that background color again to make sure that we actually can see our things. Now this takes care of actually being able to click anywhere in the page. But what if we want to have links and buttons in there that it sh that should be other functionality and not go to the other page that more dog news in this case points to. If we add the button and links, it still doesn't work. So this one still, as you can see here, points to docs.html. So if I click on that one, I go to the docs page. I don't go to the link itself yet. If we look at the, C uh, at the JavaScript and the CSS and the HTML that we have right now, all I put in there was actually another button and I positioned that a button absolutely. Again, because the list item is positioned relative, it's actually on the top right there right now. I also gave the, uh, gave the link a color to make sure that you actually can see that it's different from the text. And in the HTML, it's just a normal link in there. And I put a button in there it's important actually to have a label on a button. If, the, if there's no label assigned to it, it actually would mean that a screen reader user would hear button X and button X makes no sense. So if you put an area label on that one, 
click to close, the screen reader would say click to close instead of X and get rid of the content of the button and doesn't care about it any longer. Now these don't show up on top of it now, so what do we need to do to fix that? Not that hard to consider, seeing that we actually have a set index of 1 on the link. We just put a set index of 2 on the link and on the button. And that way they actually show up on top of the main cover that we put on top of the LI. Uh, we also need to position the link relatively, because otherwise it actually would not be uh, applying the Z index. You need to have some positioning on it to get a Z index to be applied. In case you have a problem with Z index and you're not quite sure how the whole things work, there's a great new feature in developer tools called 3D View. So you can turn that on by just doing Command Shift P and doing 3D View. And then you see a 3D view of the current document in the developer tools. So this one shows you the set index right now of the elements. So it shows you that the link has a set index of two and that the button has a set index of two and that it's on top of everything else in the document itself. You can also just see the DOM structure where you can actually see how deep nested the DOM is in this case. And in this case, the biggest one is actually the navigation that I created down there, not the HTML that we're talking about. But this is a very interesting and simple way to actually understand where your set indexes are and what is covering what in case you're confused about that one. So that one actually created the buttons and the things that work right now. But the problem is that it's actually not that pretty yet. We want to make sure that when you hover over it, it shows you that what the current card is and it also in generally give a bit more feedback to the end user. And for that, the easiest way to do is actually add hover effects and transitions. Now, if you add hover effects, you will see that there is a drop shadow now on there and something just highlighting the current card, which makes it much more engaging. It actually gives the user something to look at and know what they're doing right now. And the thing to do is like you don't need any library or anything for that. All you have to do is transitions in CSS. So when we look at the adding hover effects here right now, and we can rid of that one to make it more readable. All I did was put a transition 400 milliseconds on the LI. So any change to the CSS right now will be within 400 milliseconds. And then I created a hover design for that. So in, in, uh, in click of hover, may A main, give it a color, a background color that's different. And I also set a focus within. This is important because hover is only a mouse thing. So if I use my keyboard, for example, and I focus on any of the focusable elements inside that LI, I apply the same style to that LI. Focus within is pretty new, but it's actually really, really useful and I'm really excited about it. We also have another hover on the button itself. So if you, in case you haven't realized that, it actually is not visible in the main one. But if I roll over, it becomes visible right now. I do that by setting the opacity of it to zero and changing it to the opacity of one once you actually hover over it. Now that's good, but right now it doesn't do anything when I click on that button. It actually doesn't hide the element yet. So for this, for the first time in this tutorial, we need some JavaScript because, okay, we could do some checkbox tricks and, and select it and check then whatever in CSS, but these are all kind of uh, uh, iffy in terms of screen readers as well. And I like to have control and JavaScript is a good thing to get, to get some control in there. So if I now go to hide on click the example, I can now click the X buttons here and get rid of the cards. Now, how is that done? Let's take a look. Hiding on click. We didn't do anything else in the CSS. That stays the way it is right now. We've done almost everything that we can do in CSS. Now it's JavaScript's turn. What I'm doing here is using event delegation to apply a click handler on the UL itself, on the list item. So I get a reference to the list item with query selector, and then I add an event listener of click on it. I read out if the node name that I clicked on is a button. And if it was a button, then I just go up the node tree one and remove that node from the page. And that one means that no matter how many actually items I would have in my list, it would always work because I just click on this button here, it realizes it's the parent node there. I click on that button and it's the other parent node. Now that's nice, but it just disappears. How about we make it a bit smoother to actually make it more interesting for users? So how is that done? We're using CSS transitions. And the fun thing about CSS transitions is that they also fire JavaScript events. So we can put another event listener in the document to actually react to the end of the transition. The first thing I added in the CSS is a to delete class and that one just sets the opacity to zero. As we have to transition on the LI, 
that actually goes within four milliseconds, so it's a smooth fading away of the card itself. In the JavaScript, then, all I need to do is instead of just having the, uh, the click button and listening to it, I actually set the transition to one second because I didn't want to have it in 400 milliseconds. I wanted to make it a bit uh, longer. And then I add the uh, class to delete to the li that of the button that I clicked on. So if I click on that button, the li will actually get a class called to delete. And then I can have another event listener or listen to another event on the list called transition end. And if that one ends, actually that's the end of the transition, it fires that event. And then I can test if the current class contains to delete and then remove it. The problem with transition end is, is that it fires at every event that's going on there. So basically all the, the, uh, the fading that I'm doing here as well, that also fi fires that uh, event listener here. So I have to make sure that I actually clicked on the button and I can make sure by having an element that actually has to delete on it. So as only the button click would apply that class and the hover would not apply that class because we didn't need it. So again, if I click that one right now, it's fading away nicely. You can actually look at that in developer tools as well. So you can see the change of the element as well. So if we open that one here and we have the class full click and the allies here, and I click on that one, it now gets a class to delete and a transition. And once it's done, it just removes that li item in there for us. Now, one thing that's missing here is though that not everybody likes animations or not everybody can deal with animations. You should be very careful not to animate everything because it can confuse users. And some users have turned off animations in their operating system. I had done that as well when I did this tutorial and I debugged it for half an hour because I didn't know why nothing was happening. But you can actually check that both in CSS and in JavaScript that people want animations or don't, anim don't want animations with a media query. So if you now look at the final version of that one here, uh, it actually does the same thing. But if I were to turn off animations in the, uh, in the browser, it's, uh, in the operating system itself, it wouldn't show these animations. Now you can do that in the settings of the, uh, of the operating system itself. So you can go to, for example, here on a Mac, you can go to the accessibility settings and you can say that you in the display, you can uh, don't want have don't want to have any motion, reduce motion. So that one would turn it off for the whole operating system. But if you don't want to change that every single time and you just want to test it in your uh, in your tool, there's also a functionality in developer tools that actually simulates that. So if you go in developer tools again, you press the command shift P and you look for reduced motion. And then you can basically say emulate CSS prefers reduced motion reduce. So if we now go to the final version of this one that does that check and I turned off transitions right now, this should not transition smoothly, but just go away. And you can see that right now, there's no delay. It basically just jumps and it's gone. We can also try that again. So basically I can go to command shift P and say reduce motion and turn that one off the emulation. And if I now reload that document, it should do the fading away and sorting it cleanly again. So here it fades again. We're, got, we're done well. I use Match Media to check the CSS media query in JavaScript. For that, you can use Window Match Media and you have to put parentheses around it. That's very important. So I ask for, does, is the setting prefers reduced motion reduce set? And the matches will be true then. And if that's the case, I just do uh, the original just hiding with one single uh, uh, event delegation. And if the reduced motion is not set to reduce, then I do the other thing where I set the transition and I go for transition end. So that's basically it. We now made it accessible. We made sure that it actually works in screen readers. I will have a different video that I show you where I can use a screen reader because that's rather annoying right now. And that's basically the code that we had to do. So if you look at the full version of this, there's actually not that much content to be done. Just make sure you use the right HTML, you take CSS to what it's good for, and you do a bit of JavaScript that also talks to the powers of CSS. Now, a bit of word to the wise, the transition end thing can be iffy. So I don't always trust completely on it. In this case, it's not that problematic. But if, for example, people have turned it on on some operating system, it might not fire at all. So always testing for the match media makes sense. And if you want to 
uh, chain animation, chain transitions, I found the best way to do that is actually with set, uh, set timeouts in JavaScript, but that's another tutorial. I hope you learned something and I hope that wasn't boring to you, but I just had fun finding a way to actually make that happen without any big framework or anything like that. Nothing stops you from putting that now into a web component, for example, and make it invisible for people and just use this card as a web component, but that's something for another tutorial.